Welcome everyone to this session for students uh, that are tips for completing the CREATE performance task for AP Computer Science Principles. My name is Crystal Furman and I am the Director for Curriculum Instruction and Assessment for Computer Science Principles. I have with me tonight Maureen Reyes, who is from our AP Program Management side that works on AP Computer Science Principles. She's gonna help me with the Q&A. So as we present tonight, if you have questions about the course or um, Computer Science Principles, the exam, anything at all, you can type those questions right into the q and I'll probably pause throughout to get some of those questions answered, uh, and Maureen will answer anything that she can answer um, in the meantime. So let's get started. So tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, um, we're going to give an overview of the exam and the create performance task. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about ways in which you can plan out the completion of your create performance task. And then we're gonna talk about collaboration um, without running into issues with plagiarism. But before we get started, I just wanna emphasize that by the time you start the create performance task, you should have done a lot of practice with programming. You should be really comfortable with the programming environment that you've been developing in, and you should have practice with um, designing and implementing programs of your choice. And so I wanted to share with you some of the programs that we see students uh, developing in the past. So sometimes students do something like this student did. They did a Connect Four game. And so they thought that their purpose would be something along the lines of entertaining or um, making a game. And so they created a Connect Four game. Another student wanted to um, recommend videos based on people's movie preferences and genre. So that was their, their app that they created. Here's another one where this student wanted to help, help people um, have their mouse reflexes improve. And so they made a target game where you click on the targets and that's supposed to improve your ability to click the mouse. Um, this student here created a Spanish, French, an English translator to help uh, students or anyone learn uh, a new language. And then in this program, this student created a typing game to help you practice your typing. In this program, a student was really concerned about the environment. And so they wanted to have an app that would help you to understand um, whether or not you are contributing, contributing positively to the environment or negatively to the environment. And then in this one here, this um, app where it says disconnect, this student really wanted um, a way for them to monitor their screen time uh, and wanted to have some screen-free challenges and provided activities just to help people who may be struggling with some screen addiction. So when we go through this uh, information about the CREATE performance task, keep this in mind that this program is a program of your choice. So we want it to be something that you're interested in to solve a problem that you see in the world or to pursue an interest that's important to you. Before we get into the steps for planning, let's talk a little bit about the exam. So the Computer Science Principles exam has two parts. It has a multiple choice section that is 70 multiple choice questions, and you'll take that during the exam administration in May. But we also have this create performance task, which hopefully you've heard about from your teacher. Um, it, it comprises 30% of the exam, and the teachers will give you 12 hours in class to complete that. Um, there's a whole... Um, set of instructions that we'll walk through tonight. And then there's also scoring guidelines that can be found on AP Central so that you can learn what the readers who will be scoring your work are going to be looking for when they score your work in June. The submission deadline for this year for May is May 2nd, 2022 at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. A lot of times we get questions about this 12 hours of class time and whether or not you can work beyond the 12 hours and work outside of class. And the answer to that is yes. So if you've got a program that is gonna take you a little longer to develop and you need to work outside those 12 hours of class time, you absolutely can do that. We do recommend that you complete your written response work and your independent work inside the classroom. 
There is a section in the course and exam description on page 161. There's a page that's really helpful to students. It gives the task verbs. So for in the performance test, there's certain words we use that maybe you're not sure exactly what we mean because we say something like capture or describe. So this task verbs slide um, page is a good page for you to look at uh, and so that you understand what do some of these words mean when I'm reading through the performance task. But we have a whole set of student handouts that are for you as students. They give you a general overview and general requirements for the performance task. The performance task has three submission components, the program code, a video that shows your program working, and written responses. You're scored on the written responses in the video. So if you if you only submit the program code, you will not get a you'll you'll not earn any points for the create, create performance task. So it's really important that you do all three components of the create performance test so that you can earn credit. So let's talk about the program code. In the program code, like I said at the beginning, you can, you can choose to do a program of your choice, something in pursuit and interest that's important to you. You do, however, have a few requirements that you have to meet. This program has to show that you understand how to do input and output. It has to show that you know how to use a list and use that list to manage complexity in your program. It, you must have at least one procedure that contributes to the program's intended purpose, uh, an algorithm that includes sequencing, selection, and iteration. That's part of this procedure. And then a call to that procedure, just so that we know that it's actually something that's doing something in your program. And then the last bullet is output. So input and output are kind of the bookends of this. You are allowed to collaborate on the programming portion of the performance task only. The video and the written response has to be done independently. And when we say that you can collaborate, the people that you can collaborate with are other computer science principals, students, current students. Those are the only people that you can collaborate with. You can't collaborate with former students or computer science A students or your brother who's taking computer science in college or your mom who's a software engineer or your teacher. You have to collaborate or you don't have to collaborate at all. If you're going to collaborate, it has to be with another computer science principal student, current student. How many students can collaborate on the Create Performance Test? It's kind of up to you and how you design your collaborative groups. We recommend two to three. Um, and, and I've provided four bullets here of just different ways that collaboration could happen, but these are not the only ways that collaboration can happen. So these are just situations that I think are probably most common where maybe you have two students that are writing the entire program together using maybe pair programming. That's where you have one student who is the driver and the other student is the navigator. And so the navigator is telling the driver what they want to see in the program code. And what the, what the um, driver does is the driver maybe helps to ensure that there's th those ideas are incorporated correctly into the code. And then you switch often, you switch those roles often. So one person is driving and one person is navigating. Uh, and then after maybe by class period or by every 20, 30 minutes, you switch roles. Another way that you could do it is you could have two or more students who have a large program that they've divided up into separate parts, each owning their own piece and writing that piece and then assembling it into a finished program. Another way that students can do it is they can um, complete the program independently and their collaboration could come in with getting feedback on the program or getting help with debugging or assisting. So those are all ways that I think are probably most common for students to be collaborating. The key is that you need to make sure that you are an actively engaged member of the creation, a member of the group that's creating the program code. If you are not actively engaged, you will not understand what the program is doing enough to complete the written response. So you have to be actively engaged. Any program code that's written that you are not actively engaged in, you should cite. So in that second bullet from the previous slide where I said it could be a group of two or three students who each divide the program up into parts, each independently writing, and then combining those together, the students should tag which pieces of the program that they wrote independently. And then those are the only pieces they really should be using in their written response because those are really going to be the pieces that they understand the best um, when, they, when they go to write about it. 
Okay. So because you have to do this citation for anything that's not really yours, it's really important that before you get to the create performance task, you practice adding comments in the language that you're using. Some of the programming languages do not allow you to add comments. So this would be something that you would have to do um, in like maybe in a Word document or in a PDF before you before you final submit it as a PDF document for your code. All right, the next section is the video and the video has some uh, requirements in terms of what you need to see in it as well as um, size restrictions and type of video formats. So let's first talk about what needs to be included. You need to show input and some kind of functionality and output for the program. We ask that you don't have anything that is going to be distinguishing information about you in the video. That includes voice narration. So you can use te text captions, but you don't have to. Um, it's fine just to have a video with no text captions as well. Some students want to do that. Um, they feel like it helps them to explain what their video, um, th what their video is about. It's all up to you as to uh, whether you want to have a text caption in your video. But if that's something you're going to do, you should be doing that in practice prior to um, trying to create a video for the create performance task. Remember that your video has to be certain formats. So these are the formats that are acceptable, can be no longer than one minute in length and 30 megabytes in size. Even if you're one minute, one second over, the digital portfolio will not accept your video as an upload. And um, sometimes that's the reason why uh, students struggle to get their videos uploaded. So if the digital portfolio isn't accepting it, maybe check to see if you've violated the size requirements. Um, can Why can students not use voice narration? It's really for your protection. We really train our readers to um, understand the meaning of implicit bias. And that is, you know, their own biases that they, they don't even really know that they have that could potentially play into your score. Um, and maybe they pick up something about you. Maybe they pick up your gender or your ethnicity or where in the country you're from um, based on your voice. And so we want to take all of that out so that they, um, they're judging your work on the merit of the work and not on what they know about you or what they're assuming they might know about you. Um, from this implicit bias. So we train them to ignore implicit biases uh, so because that's good for all students, but for your protection, it's best practice for you to remain anonymous during your scoring. Uh, students are not penalized if they do use voice over narration. Like I said, we train them to make sure that they, they don't have some bias in there, but it's called implicit for a reason. It's because they don't realize that they're doing it. So it's always best for you just to be as anonymous as possible when you submit your work. And if you are gonna use captions, make sure you practice that before you get to the create performance task. All right, the next section is on the written response. So one thing that students always ask is in the, student test directions, it says that the word count is 750 words, but in the digital portfolio, it allows me to go to 850 and they don't understand what's up with that. So what's up with that is there's a little bit of a grace. Um, it's really hard to write to an exact 750 words. And so we provide a little bit of grace of hundred words, making it an absolute max of 850. Um, we give you some guidance as to how many words per prompt, and that's really just a guideline. You can go under in one and over in another, and it's fine. It's a total word count that matters. In the digital portfolio, you'll see that word count at the top and at the bottom of the page, and each box will have like a display for the word count as well. Um, but the key piece here, and part of the reason why we have a word count, is to help you stay focused in your answer to be really succinct and make sure that you're answering the specific question that you were given. Uh, if you have too many words, what we find is that students then sometimes um, talk around the answer instead of getting to the point and getting right into what the answer to the question is. So be succinct, less is more. Sometimes um, you, don't, you don't have to answer things we didn't ask for. Read the question, make sure you're answering that question in the most succinct way possible. 
Okay, so we're going to dive into each one of the written responses. So 3A is kind of a helps the reader set the stage for what did they see in the video? What's your program all about? And the biggest thing here is that there is a difference between the purpose of the program, why did you decide to make this, and the program functionality. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this when we get into planning. But um, I put the definitions in here. They are in the scoring guidelines. The purpose is the problem being solved or the creative interest being pursued through the program. So if you read the prompt up front, and we're going to take a look at that language, you're really supposed to be creating a program that either solves a problem or helps you to pursue some creative interest of yours. So why did you create this program? And the answer can't be because it's an exam, right? It has to be some problem that you're solving or some creative expression that you're trying to pursue or creative interest. So that's the purpose. That's different from the program functionality, which is the behavior of the program during execution. It's often described by how the user interacts with it. And we're gonna look at some examples of, of the difference between program function and program purpose in a little bit. So pro tip, Purpose and function are different things. Know, the def know those definitions. Last year, students wrote the same things in purpose versus function. They're different things and you need to write different things. In 3B, what they're focusing in on 3B is the list component. So you have to have a list that manages complexity. So you're gonna take some snippets of code that show the list, show data being stored in the list, and show how that data is being processed and used. And then you're gonna answer some questions. You're gonna answer some questions about what the name of the list is, describe what the data contains in the list, right? Um, and so that's gonna be one rubric row where they're, the readers are just gonna look, do you have a list? Are you using the list? You are, great. And then the next part is to explain how your list manages complexity in your program. And that um, needs to go beyond just what your, your generic definitions of managing complexity to really get to um, how it relates to your specific program. So it's explain why your program code could not be written or how it would have to be written differently. So you really need to make sure you're connecting what you learned about that into um, the, the answer, what you learned about managing complexity into your program for your answer. Uh, so there's like a little side things that are important. Data abstraction must make the program easier to develop. Alternatives would be more complex or easier to maintain. So future changes to so size uh, of the list would otherwise require significant modifications to the code. So we kind of put that in there as some guidance for you, um, but be really specific about connecting this with your program. Generic answers will not get credit, and we're going to look at a generic answer that says all the right things in terms of how lists manage complexity in programs, but the student never ties it back to their own program, which is super important. Okay, the next part is 3C. In 3C, this is all about the procedure that has a parameter and then also has an algorithm within that. So again, you're gonna um, choose some snippets of code to put in where you've got your procedure and then also a call to that procedure and then you're gonna write about it. You're gonna describe what it does and how it contributes to the overall function. And then you're gonna go through that algorithm and explain it in detailed steps so that someone else would be able to recreate it. One key thing here that's important that's called out is built-in or existing procedures and language structures such as event handlers and main methods are not considered student developed. And so if you included those, you would lose, um, you would lose points for that. And then in 3D, we are looking for you to think about calls to the procedure that you captured in 3C and um, think about uh, different paths through your algorithm. So your algorithm has a loop. So maybe it loops and maybe it doesn't. Maybe those are the two triggers. It has a, it should have an if statement because it has selection or some kind of selection. It doesn't have to be an if statement, but some kind of selection. So those selection statements would have it cause different paths to happen. Um, a common question that we've had in the past is, do you have to have an if and an else? 
And the answer is no, the absence of doing something is a different path, but you have to demonstrate that in the calls. And just remember that these test cases are for the procedure identified in 3C. Okay, so before we get into actually planning this out, do we have any questions about um, the create performance task in general and what is required? Yes, Crystal, we have many questions. First, I want to say um, we're getting a lot of questions about the recording of the webinar. We are recording it. We will be emailing you a link um, after this webinar, so you will get a recording of this for back to. Uh, Crystal, there's a lot of questions about what programming language. So can you just explain to students um, the programming language and also um, the question of like whether they can create any type of project they want? Can you address that? Yeah, absolutely. So the programming language that you use should be one that you're really familiar with that is able to do to meet those requirements that we just talked about. Your program has to have lists in it. It has to have procedures in it and has to have the ability to do sequencing, selection, iteration, and input and output. The only one that we have stated in the CED explicitly that you cannot use is HTML because HTML does not do some of the things that we require you to be able to do in this task. I would recommend that you use whatever programming language you're using in class. So you don't, what you don't want to do is learn a programming language and then for the create performance task, choose something you've never programmed in before and try to learn that for the create performance test. That's not gonna work for you. You have 12 hours to do this test. So you really should be using whatever you're, you've been practicing so that you're really good at it for this um, create performance task. It is 30% of your grade. So you wanna make sure you're doing a really good job there. Um, what was the second question, Maureen? I'm sorry. It's okay, just um, that students uh, are allowed to create any program they want. Yes. So you are allowed to create anything that you want. And we're going to talk about how do you figure that out um, in the next section uh, when we're talking about cleaning, completing the create performance task and some time management. How do you figure out what do you want to do for this? Um, you can you can create pretty much anything as long as it meets those requirements of having a list and then having a procedure with sequencing selection and iteration in it, uh, which most programs will have some some algorithm components that have sequencing selection iteration in it and and should have procedures so we're going to talk about that part next there's um a few questions about the the word count uh, and the limit so um is the word count limit for every box collectively or 850 words each of those boxes so the it's for the entire written response. 850 is the total of all the boxes. Your program code does not count because your program code is going to be an image. So that doesn't count towards your word count. So um, each box has a an estimate in it, like an approximately 100 words or 150 words. It will tell you kind of approximately how many words you should have in each box. Um, but then your total written response cannot exceed 850. Okay, why don't we move on? Okay, great. All right, so this is a process that I am suggesting. It's not, it maybe a, maybe a, there's a different process that'll work well for you, but based on what we know that students are doing and students that are doing well, um, based on feedback that we've received about create performance task, um, this is a process that might work well for you. So the first thing is to do some pre-planning. So before your teacher even starts off, you should kind of know the task. So that's part of what we went through tonight. There is another video out there that is a create deep dive where I spend a lot of time going through the directions, a lot of time going through the scoring guidelines and how things are scored. Um, your teacher should be going over the task uh, and, and that video might be a good one for you to look up. Lots and lots of practice. We kind of talked about that already. Make sure you've been practicing writing programs and use the language that you're going to use for create. And then before you start, you should know, like, are you going to do this with, with some collaborative partner or partners, or are you planning to do this independently? So that should be a decision that's made before you start. And then what you should do is you should start with your planning brainstorm some programming ideas, and then draft the draft your answer for 3A. Then once you get into developing your program, you can start capturing your code PDFs. 
You can also draft your answer to 3D. 3D is about test cases. So once you have that procedure written, you can start looking at um, 3D and writing some test cases for that because you should have in your mind how your program is going to work and respond to input um, even before you, you write that. Then create the video. Make sure you're adhering to the file sizes. Then draft your 3B and 3C and finalize your written response and then go through the final submission process where you're submitting the three components. And we're gonna deep dive into each one of these. Um, one thing that I think is a pro tip here is we hear from students how daunting doing the written response is because they save it to the end. So what I'm suggesting here is that you write pieces of the written response throughout the process so that you're not leaving the this big written response, this 850, 750 to 850 words to the very end. Write it as you go and then it'll be less daunting. So let's talk about the first part, pre-planning considerations. So some things to think about before you start, make sure you know the task, read through those test directions, there's guidelines, there's scoring guidelines, ask any questions that you have to your teacher, Look at examples online um, and know how the scoring guidelines will be applied. Um, as I said before, there is a create deep dive. I believe they've linked that in the resources as well to this webinar where you can find that. It's an hour long deep dive that I did last year walking through all of that stuff. Practice, 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 practice. Um, your teacher should be assigning scaffolded topic questions from AP Classroom that help you practice the right written responses. And then, are you are you going solo or are you going with a partner? So I made a little flow chart for y'all. Um, what's your choice? Are you gonna do all the work yourself or are you going to select a partner? If you are, then how are you gonna share the work with them? Um, are you gonna do pair programming? Are you gonna do it like a divide and conquer? Like, what is that gonna look like? And who should you partner with? It's not always it's not always great to partner with your best friend if they're not gonna, you know, be the person that's you know keep bringing out the best in you and bringing out the best in your program and you know staying on track and um, that type of thing. So throughout the school year, I would recommend you have different um, collaborative partners throughout the school year so that you know who do you work best with, who's gonna bring the best. Um, ideas to the table and bring out the best in you uh, so that you, you have a great program in the end. Uh, where will you draft your written responses? So you can draft your written responses right in the digital portfolio. It keeps a revision history for you, so that's great. It's something that only is owned by you, so no one's able to get in there and um, you know copy what you've written because the written response is yours and yours alone. Uh, in Google Docs, sometimes it's happened where students got access to other students' written responses if they drafted them in Google Docs, and then that causes issues um, because then if somebody copies your work, you're both flagged for plagiarism. So you could do it in a Google Doc. It also has a revision history, which is nice, um, and then you could copy-paste that into the AP Digital Portfolio, but our recommendation would be to just do it in the digital portfolio. You're the sole owner. It can't be shared with anybody else. And it really does add a layer of protection for you for your exam. All right. So now the teacher has said, we're going to get started on this. These are the first two hours. Like, you, like I said at the beginning, you have 12 hours to complete this. These are your first two hours. I put at the top here... Um, the first paragraph that you'll see in the student handouts on the create performance task. So it says programming is a collaborative and creative process that brings ideas to life through the development of software. In the create performance task, you will design and implement a program that might, and then everything in blue kind of speaks to the purpose. Your program might solve a problem, enable innovation, explore personal interests, or express creativity. This all speaks to this first part here, 3AI. What is the purpose of the program? Why did you create this? So you should brainstorm a few ideas, three to five ideas um, that think about the purpose. Like why, why are you doing this? What's the reason? And then you gotta kind of narrow those ideas down. So once you have a set of ideas, think about the requirements for the task. How would you use a list? in this program? Will it allow you to create a procedure that has sequencing, selection, and iteration in it? 
And do you have the skills to complete at least some of the functionality? So sometimes students have really big ideas because they have a really large problem that they're trying to solve that's really interesting to them. And that's fine. Can you generate enough functionality with that program to have at least be a good starting foundation of a program that meets these requirements of having a list, a procedure with sequencing, selection, and iteration? Do you have the skills to do that? So it's okay to, to dream big. It's okay to choose something really large, uh, even if you can't get it fully 100% implemented in the 12 hours, as long as you can implement enough of the program where um, you can meet the, the components for submission. And do you have time to complete at least some of that? Do you have skills and do you have the time? Okay, let's talk about purpose versus function. This is where students struggled last year. So I've already given you the definitions, but I'm gonna give them to you again. The purpose is a problem being solved or creative interest being pursued. And the program functionality is the behavior of the program during execution. So what is it doing? So here's this first one. In the first one, they said they're facilitating a connect for game play experience between two players and to detect a winner. That the function of that might say something about how, you know, a user, how the user interacts with it. The user has to click a square um, and that's where their game piece goes. And then it takes turns like all of that would be how it functions. But here the purpose is to facilitate this game. Another example of a purpose, train a user's mouse reflex skills. So, and then they, they go on to talk about older generations or simply someone, someone with slower clicking times, but they're, they're really doing this to help someone improve a motor function. That's different from the function of this, this game, which would have been um, them, they would go into describing, you know, clicking on the target. And if they click on the center, they get more points. And if they click on the outside, that kind of thing. Uh, entertain the user through a fun obstacle course. So this one is a little weak. It's really just to entertain the user, but that's the purpose. The function would be to talk about, um, you know, the, the maze and how they had to, you know, move their mouse in a certain way so they didn't uh, run into the walls of the maze, that kind of thing. Suggest three action or three comedy movies that are age appropriate to the user. So this is one that's helping someone select a movie that's of their choice in terms of um, genre and age appropriateness. Entertain the user as well as teach them objects that are, uh, teach them, teach certain objects that are related to the topic. So they're entertaining. Some things we saw as functions that didn't get credit for this purpose section was something like this, move the ball to the top of the screen. So that's really talking about the, what the user is doing, right? The user is moving the ball to the top of the screen. Why? This was probably, um, if I remember correctly, this was facilitating a, um, a game that was the red light, green light game. Tell the user how many hours of music they listen to based on the number they inputted. So again, we're talking about how the user is interacting, the user is inputting a value, they're telling us how many, how many hours of music they're listening to. Why are we doing that? Um, maybe it's to help a user understand their, their music habits, how much time they spend listening to music. Um, display some favorite songs, the movie lines for the user. Why are we doing that? What's the purpose of that? Um, maybe it's to inspire someone. Um, but that's not being said in here. So that's really just talking about the function. Display the user some specific information on female senators based on categories, female senators, Democratic, uh, Democrats, or state, they choose. Okay, why are we doing that? Is that to understand information about government? Is that to help people make good decisions in elections? Like, why? what is the purpose of this? It sounds like a really great, app to have, but what's the purpose there? Uh, create a questionnaire where questions are asked to, at random to the user and they are prompted to answer it. Again, why are we, why are we doing this questionnaire? Is this to help with studying? Um, is, you know, so there has to be a reason why you're generating this. So kind of 
think about these sl subtle differences between the purpose and the function and make sure when you're answering these, these are two distinct questions. There's two separate boxes for those answers and make sure you keep purpose in the purpose and function in the function. Purpose really should be thought of upfront. Why am I, why am I making this? What am I trying to do here? Am I trying to entertain somebody? Am I trying to solve a problem for somebody? What am I doing? And framing it as a problem um, sometimes helps. So if you can think about like what problem are you trying to solve, even if it's to entertain, you're solving something um, by, by doing that. So, all right. So at the end of this one or two hours, what should you have done? So either by yourself or with a partner, you should have determined the purpose of your program have an outline for how the program will function. Uh, if you're collaborating with someone, you're determined how you will collaborate, divide or conquer, or pair programming. And you know what programming language you're gonna use to implement your program. So that's what you should have accomplished by the end of those first two hours. And then take a few minutes to independently draft your answers to 3AI as well as 3AII and 3AII. So all of the 3A, you should at least be able to get a draft of that. All right, now this is the meat section of your time here. You're gonna spend three to nine hours on the program itself. So you're gonna be, as you're following your plan, you might need to change that. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're setting aside a time with um, set a setting aside time with either your partner, or you can even think about that for yourself at the end of each hour to kind of discuss your progress, make sure that you are still in alignment and make any adjustments that you think you need to make. This is also a time in this section to draft 3D because you can, um, and once you have the procedure that you're going to use, you can think about inputs, outputs, and, and what you should be expecting for that. So things to think about when you're programming, what is the input and the output of the program? What data is being stored in the list? How is the list gonna be used to manage complexity? That's a big part of it. Can't just have a list in there. It's gotta have a, a it's gotta help your program development in some way by managing complexity. What procedures need to be developed? What are their names? Um, what are their functions? What are their parameters? What are their return types? Where will your program have sequencing, selection, and iteration? Um, be sure that you're calling your procedure. And what values, input values, will you use to test your program and to test your procedure? That flows into that 3D section. So at the end of this, you should have a working program. Um, you should have daily kept track of what you've done, what needs to be done, and what adjustments need to be made to your plan. Um, is there a list that manages complexity, a procedure with a parameter? Is there sequencing, selection, iteration in that procedure? Um, the program is 100% original, or if you use any starter code, you added some shiny new functionality that's uniquely yours. It's really important that if you start with some something else, that you add your own new functionality to that. Make sure that you've taken a few minutes to independently draft 3D. Um, you don't need to have a complete program to identify test cases and their expected outputs for that procedure. And oh, one more bullet in there. Your program code, now is the time to capture that into a PDF and upload it to the digital portfolio. That way you'll have one component done at this point. Okay, hour 10, the video. Um, make sure you've got the requirements down. You have to show input functionality and output. Make sure you're adhering to the file requirements in terms of the file types, no longer than a minute, no bigger than 30 megabytes. The video, you have to do independently. You cannot do the video with, a, with your partner. Make sure you're using some type of screen capture software. If you're using your phone to do it, make sure that the text is clear. Make sure it's not too small to read and not blurry. A lot of times videos are shaky when people do them with their phones. So um, screen capture software is probably the preferred way, but if you need to do it with your cell phone, that's always possible. Um, some students take part of their minute to show us their code. They kind of do a scroll through of the code. Don't waste your time doing that. Just show us the program running. Show us the input, the functionality, and output. Tap 
Text captions we talked about before, those are fine, but they're not necessary. So if time is an issue, I wouldn't bother with the text captions. And then at the end of this hour, you should have a video that meets your requirements here. They show input, output, and functionality that meets the file specifications. Your video is uploaded to the digital portfolio. So now you have two components done. And whoops, um, you have revisited your 3A to make sure that you have your purpose didn't change and revisit your 3A uh, double I and triple I to ensure that they match what's being shown in the video. So you drafted these originally. Now that you've done the video, 3A2 and 3A3 needed to match that video. So make sure you do that. Okay, hour 11. Now we're focusing on the written response. We've submitted the program code. We've submitted the video. Now we're looking at the written response. What's going on with this? Make sure your screen captures of your program code are clear and readable. You can actually put three captures per, um, per box in there. So make sure you do that. The font side for, size for your program code should be at least 10 point font. And um, there's a couple different approaches. You can do the screenshots first, then write, or answer 3B first and then answer 3C, right? Those are the two you still haven't drafted if you're following this plan. Your written responses have to be done completely independently. Um, so some questions, are there different procedures to choose from so you and your collaborative partner can each select a different one to use in the written response? If there are, you probably should figure that out and each select a different one if it's possible. Be sure to connect what you learned to your program. Don't use buzzwords and definitions. Your score is gonna be based on your ability to, to apply these buzzwords and definitions to your program code. And write what you know about your program without using a sample as a template. This is your program. You've just spent 10 hours really deeply with this program. You know it. You don't need to look at a sample and use that as a template. You're, you'll end up um, getting into different issues if you do that. So at the end of hour 11, what should you do? Your screenshots are readable. Even an adult who needs to enlarge them to read them on a computer can read your screenshots. Your written response is completely drafted. It's not been submitted yet because we're gonna take a final day to submit everything. Your own voice is coming through in your written responses rather than just memorized words from samples. So, and I know this because your you know this because your answers have been customized to your uniquely developed program. It's very important. It should be your own voice coming through. Make sure you're taking quality screen captures of your program code and that you've drafted all your written responses. So 3B and 3C in particular, but all the written responses at this point should be drafted. All right, final hour, you're finalizing and you're submitting. Remember the create performance task has to be submitted to the digital portfolio no later than May 2nd at 1159 p.m. Eastern time. Um, do it earlier than that. <laughs> Don't wait till the last minute. You'll give your teachers heart attacks. Um, do it earlier. Upload all components. Um, uploading all components is not the same as final submitting. So last year, some students said, well, I uploaded all my components. It doesn't matter. If you don't final submit, we don't know that you're done. So you have to go through a final submission process. It requires attestations, which we'll talk about, um, and you have to do it for each one. Last year, some people did it for one of them, and they thought that that sent everything, and it didn't. You have to do it for all three components individually. Um, we've already talked about this section, okay. So what should you be doing in this last hour? Your written response has been finalized um, and has been entered into the digital portfolio. All three of your components have been uploaded. You've completed attestations for each of the three components and you've final submitted them. And remember the deadline, May 2nd, 2022, 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. Be sure to take quality screenshots of your program code and um, I can't stress that enough. So many students, we get there and we can't read what they've written. All right, 
Any questions on the planning part of this, Maureen? Crystal, there's questions, students from questions about when they should start the create performance task. Yeah, that's great. So you really, um, if you have, if you're taking this course in a classroom with a teacher, the teacher will tell you when you're going to start. A lot of students start um, in the spring. Um, if you're doing this independent study, it really needs to be after you've had enough practice in order to be able to incorporate all the required elements. So kind of work with your teacher, see when they are planning for you to do the create performance task. They should be doing it with some wiggle room to accommodate any absences that might happen. Um, and they should be doing it with plenty of time for you to complete it and final submit before the deadline. And Crystal, I know you mentioned this earlier, but students are still asking about it. So I think we should cover it again. Can students work um, outside of the 12 hours of in-class time? Yes, you can work outside the 12 hours of class time. I would um, focus that time on the program development rather than the written response. The written response, because you have to do it independently, um, that's best done under the supervision of your teacher who can you know, ensure that you um, are doing that part ind independently. But if you need more time in program development, you certainly can work outside of class. If you need to work on the written responses outside of class, you certainly can. There's no rule that says you can't. Um, it's just my recommendation that that's part that that particular part is done inside the classroom. Any other questions, or we can move on and talk about plagiarism. Yeah, let's move on because I think there's a lot of questions about collaboration and citation. Great. Okay, so um, we encourage you to collaborate, but then we get people that get nervous about being accused of plagiarism. And um, there's a line there that we want to make sure that we're not crossing. So there's a couple different um, guidelines that I'm going to draw your attention to. So one is our plagiarism policy. And I've highlighted a couple sections where we know students get into trouble a little bit. Um, this can be found in your student handouts on page 11. Uh, but the top box really talks about acknowledging. So we talked about that already, making sure that, you know, if there's pieces of your program that you use starter code from something else, or you, you know, you had a sample in class that you, um, that you did, and then you wanted to extend it for the create performance task by adding new functionality, you really should be citing, um, what parts were part of that practice or sample, and then which parts are actually new and, um, individually yours or yours and your collaborative partner. And then when it comes to the written responses, you need to make sure that your own individual voice is clearly evident and that um, the ideas of others are acknowledged, attributed, or cited. So uh, what what's, uh, you're gonna see this uh, as we go through, I'm gonna give you some examples of where students have written words that are maybe not their own individual voice. The, there's a section on page 14 that are in the task guidelines of things you may not do. And I've highlighted this one section here because um, this kind of speaks to what I was talking about with the practice performance task. You can't submit anything that you've done with from practice um, or anything that's been revised, amended or corrected by another individual other than your collaborative partner. Um, you can extend, and we're gonna talk about that as we go through there through the rest of these slides, but make sure if you're extending a program that you are, um, adding new functionality to it. And then these are the attestations that you'll have to do when you final submit. And you have to do this for each one of the components, all three of them. Uh, and so you're affirming that the work that you're submitting is your own, that you've read the plagiarism policy, that you've read the student handouts, and that you didn't collaborate on the written response or the video. So those are attestations for you. Okay, so here's an example of someone who use some existing code. So um, the existing code happens to be the 2020 College Board Sample D, um, which was like a air hockey type um, game. And the student used that and they followed that as like an example. And what they ended up doing was they just changed things a little bit. So you can see that they changed puck X to core Y. So they changed the variable name. Only changing the variable names does not mean that you've written this uniquely yours. Um, or they changed the constants. So they changed it from 45 to 35. Again, 
they're just modifying some literals in there in those statements that's not enough they changed the way that the assignment statement was done instead of using an increment a plus plus increment they used um they they wrote it fully out um the reset's the same they they changed the output a little bit but essentially this is the same algorithm so this is plagiarism. This is an example of plagiarism. So when you are extending an existing program from practice or from samples, you need to add brand new functionality to it so that it's yours. So this is where, this is the um, guideline that the student violated with that sample. They did, they did not, um, they just submitted practice or something from someone else. Here's a sample of a written response. Everything that is in yellow is an exact match between the 2020 College Board Sample B, which is on top, and the student sample student response, which is on the bottom. So this is where you're not seeing um, much difference in these two in terms of all that yellow that matches verbatim. And then what they changed was they changed out some, some um program specific stuff. So instead of um, previous players of the game, they have grade books. Instead of um, high scores, they have grades. Uh, so they've, they've kind of made those things that are in blue specific to the program. And then because they didn't want to be caught for plagiarism, they changed out some of the words with some synonyms, right? So they said, instead of scanner class, which is how you do input, they said input. And instead of using, they said the use of. That's the same thing. Instead of document, they said file. Instead of separate separate variables, they said different grades. So these were all kind of synonyms. Um, we kind of we've got a name for this. I'm going to show you in a second. But this is where the student's voice doesn't come through at all. It's not it's not clearly evident that this is the student's work because there's so much of that that's just copied. So I um, found this graphic here that talks about, um, helps you determine, did you plagiarize? It's from the visualcommunicationguide.com and it's varying degrees of plagiarism. So on the left side is, you know, really intense plagiarism to the right side, which is um, more moderate plagiarism, but it's all plagiarism. All of these examples are examples of plagiarism. And what we see a lot of is this cherry picking. Did you cherry pick a few terms and phrases to change, but keep the rest of the text and ideas from another person's work unchanged without giving credit. That's what we're seeing in that um, written response with all of that yellow. All they did was pick a few terms to change out. And we actually, when we see this, we, we look at it and say, it looks like a little bit like kids played Mad Libs, where they just, um, you know, subbed out one word for another. So that that's an extreme, on the extreme end of plagiarism. The other thing we see students do sometimes is we see them do mosaics where, you know, they may have cited everything, but they use very little of their own words and thoughts in there. So just be careful of, of those, those things. So how do you avoid plagiarism while you're collaborating? What should you do? So the first thing, be sure to extend any existing programming code by adding new functionality. Use this new functionality for your written response. Stay away from, um, you know, if you, there, I know there's um, a filter out there in, in some of the samples, if you're using that, um, that's great. But then write a new function that's uniquely yours and that's using that filtered data in some way to solve a problem and then write about that instead of writing about the filter function. When possible, use different procedures and lists than your collaborative partner. That's not always gonna be possible because sometimes your program only has one list. So that's going to be difficult there, but different procedures might be possible for you to do. So if, when it's possible, that's my advice. Avoid using generic language, especially when you're describing how lists manage complexity. Credit isn't awarded anyway. If you're just going to use buzzwords um, and definitions, you have to tie it to your program. So um, avoid that generic language because that's not your that's not your voice probably it's probably some definition that you memorize so here's the prompt explain how selected the selected list manages complexity in your program by explaining why your program code could not be written or how it could be written differently if you did not use the list and here is an example response which i'm going to read to you 
This example response sounds really good. It says the lists are extremely helpful when wanting to store a large amount of data uh, values or data. Having the ability to use lists prevents one from having to create a bunch of different variables that would all have the same name and only store a single piece of data or a single value. Using a bunch of individual variables instead of a list makes your code unorganized, lengthy, and prone to mistakes. A user could possibly reuse the same variable name and delete one of their values altogether. Otherwise, lists uh, overall, lists allow for condensed and more organized code. That all sounds great. It's like um, you could pick that out of a textbook. So it's textbook why we use lists, but there's no connection to the program that the student used the list in. There's no connection to the actual list itself. It's all a bunch of definitions and buzzwords around managing complexity. So the student that wrote this did not earn any credit for this row. Um, another tip, avoid using provided sentence starters or templates. So if you get a template from a teacher or some sentence starters, avoid using that. Sit down, read the question, answer the question. You're all really smart kids. You've had practice with this. It's your program. You know it better than anybody else. Write about it. Don't use sentence starters. Don't use a template. Use different sample data, test data than your collaborative partner. You may want to kind of talk about that, like, okay, I want to make sure we're not using the same values. These ones are the ones I'm using. Don't use them. It's kind of thing. So that you're using different stuff. Um, type your answers directly into the digital portfolio as this account is, isn't shared with others and can only be, um, we can also look at your, your revision history in there. Using Google Docs is fine too, but the document shouldn't be shared with anyone else. Um, so the digital portfolio is much more secure for you for your written responses. All right. Any additional questions, Maureen? We have only a couple of minutes left. Yes. Um, there were questions about um, using API or libraries or frameworks. How can students use them and not be um, flagged for plagiarism? So if you're going to use a library or an API, that's fine. You're going to... Um, put that into your program code and use it, but then you're gonna develop your own function and your own list. Uh, you're gonna create your own list to store values in, and those are the things you're gonna write about. You're not gonna write about anything that's in the libraries or in the APIs that you're using. Are there any limits to the size or format of complexity of the program submitted as long as it meets the requirements? Nope, it just has to meet those requirements. We have students that, write really elaborate things because they really got interested in the topic that they had and um, have written really elaborate things. And we have students that uh, write relatively simple programs um, that meet the requirements. So um, as I said in the beginning, you could have an idea that for a really big program, but only be able to accomplish in the time that we have a, a certain portion of it that meets the requirements. And that would be totally fine as well. When you're working with a partner, um, do the individual videos have to be unique even if the program code is the same? Your individual video just needs to be uniquely created by you. I, I get that your video probably will be very similar to your um, collaborative partner because your, your program is your program and it's gonna function the same. But um, your input's gonna be different because you didn't collaborate on what the input's gonna be. Um, if it's a game, the way you play the game is gonna look different. So those videos probably won't be the same. If you're working with a partner and you divide the program into two, does your section have to have all the components that, you know, the section that you specifically programmed, um, like the list, the iteration, or do these components need to be in your program altogether? So you are going to want to be actively engaged in creating the, th the program code that you're going to include in the written response. So no, you can, you can divide and conquer and say like, okay, these pieces you're going to do, these pieces I'm going to do. But when you go to write, you should be writing about the things that you wrote. So if there's, if there's only one list, you might want to write that portion together so that you both have a good understanding of, of that list and how that list is being used. Crystal, one uh, one last question. So, you know, there's a lot of questions about, you know, if they're using pictures or music or anything in their video or in the program, can you just reiterate that anything that's used needs to be cited? 
Yep. And they can, you can cite that right into the program code and just say, I mean, it's just an acknowledgement. It doesn't have to be super fancy. It's just an acknowledgement that says the pictures that I use are not mine. I got them from XYZ place. So it doesn't have to be a really complicated citation. Uh, it just has to be an acknowledgement that you are pulling that music or data or whatever in from a different source. And you sort of just answered this, but just to be clear, everybody's asking, you know, what specific format for the citation? Um, so there is no specific format. A little comment in your code that says um, the music in my in my program is from and wherever you got it from is just fine. I know we're at time, so I'll just throw in two quick questions about the video. Um, is there a preferred functionality that needs to be shown in the video? It would be the primary functionality for your program. So um, it's going to be the function that you describe in 3A. So whatever that function is that you're describing in 3A should be also what's in the in the video. Those should be connected. Um, and can the video be edited? It, it can be edited to add text caption, it needs to be a continuous run. So it can't be like sectioned off with like different pieces, it needs to be a continuous running of the program. And finally, um, can you use an automated narration like a robot speaking? I don't see why not. That would be fine if that's if that's something that you're comfortable with. Please make sure that you've practiced doing that prior to trying to do it with your video at the very end. And remember, narration's not required. It's, um, it's your preference to do that. Uh, Lots of students did not do that this last year. So um, that would be you know, low on my priority list to include narrations or captions in my video. Um, so we didn't, I know we're at time, we didn't get to all, all of the questions obviously, but I think many or most of the questions can be answered uh, by the students reviewing the student handout, looking at the digital portfolio user guide. Um, Crystal, can you just um, remind students where those resources are linked right now and that they um, will want to bookmark those links. Yeah, so there should be a resources tab um, in this webinar that has all of that stuff linked in, um, the, the digital portfolio user guide, the course and exam description, the student handouts, the scoring guidelines, um, the create deep dive that we did last year, like all of that should be linked in the resources of this particular webinar. Um, but they also can be found on AP Central, on the um, AP Computer Science Principal site for students, as well as for teachers. Um, both of those sites are public. You can find all of that information on AP Central. All right, Crystal, thank you so much. That's a wrap. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everybody for attending.